All right, welcome to church this morning. We're glad that you're here as you make your way in and grab a seat. Uh, we'll get started this morning. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. It's good to have some good fathers around, isn't there? Some of I've already received photos of some of your Father's Day presents, and uh, that's okay. We have a Father's Day present for you in a little bit. Uh, in the service, but we're glad to have each and every one of you with us. If you're visiting with us, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to spend the morning with us. Uh, we look forward to having a good time uh, in the church service together this morning. Uh, well, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then Brother June will come and lead us in some songs. And um, there'll be some songs this morning about our Heavenly Father. And so hopefully you will enjoy that and sing out with us. And, uh, if you're not going to sing out, my son will sing out. That'll be okay. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you so much for this time you've given us to come together. Lord, we thank you that you are the best example of a father that we could have. And Lord, we thank you for how much you love us and all that you do for us each and every day. Pray that be with, be with the service this morning. I'll be with all that's said and done. May it bring honor and glory to you. And Lord, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Oh, 
of those who've gone before us and stood for the faith. Anybody? One or two of you. If you haven't, get your hands on some. Uh, there are some phenomenal things that people went through just to be able to hold the Bible you hold in your hands. And uh, so we never should forget that and be thankful uh, for that. And all they went through is they brought the gospel with them wherever they went. Uh, but now we're going to have our children's story time. And um, on the back table, there's their children's activity sheet, so you can grab one of those if you didn't get one, and uh, you can do that. Now, I forgot to grab the clicker for the pictures on the wall, and so I'm, I'm going to try to have to hope that the guys in the back room are able to keep up with me and put the photos up there, okay? And then we're going to be learning about... Now, if I were to say to you the name Abram, how many of you would think that I said a man's name wrong, or would you know who I was talking about? How many think I said the name wrong? A few people said I said the name wrong. How many think you know who I'm talking about, and you think you know who the person is? All right, well, you've got to remember, we're going to learn about Abram, who will become Abraham. Uh, he has a name change uh, in his life. There's a few of the men in the Bible who had that happen. And so we're going to learn about Abram this morning, or Abraham. Now, Abram grew up, and he lived in a place in the city of the in Ur of the Chaldees. Now, Ur of the Chaldees, you may say, where in the world is Ur of the Chaldees? It's in modern-day Iraq. So if you can think of where modern-day Iraq is, you know where Abram came from. All right? And can you imagine one day, well, Abram was, I guess, communing with God. You know how in the morning when you get up and you read your Bible and you pray and you, you have fellowship with the Lord each day, which you should, right? Whether it's when you get up or before you go to bed sometime during the day, it's always a good thing to have. If you want to be crazy and have it in the morning and the evening, I'm sure God would not mind that, would he? Probably not. All right? And so one day when he was doing that, and it was a bit different back in the Bible times because he didn't have the whole Bible like you have. And so he and God were having a conversation. Can you imagine this? Okay? How many of you are husbands here? Husbands. In other words, you have a wife and maybe children. Yeah? Husbands. All right. If you have a if you're a husband, can you imagine this? 
One day in your daily communication with God, God tells you, pack up the family and move. And logically, you would say, where to? Right? How would you respond if he says, till I tell you to stop? I'll show you when you get there. But you must go. And when you get there, I'll let you know. How many of you think you would have a hard time that morning at breakfast talking to your wife? Few of you? Yeah? Yeah. Can you imagine after that walking in and uh, coming up and saying, you know what, dear? Uh, we're a couple of things ahead now. Uh, you know what, dear? Uh, God spoke to me today and uh, we're moving. And Miss Sarai, not Sarah, Sarai, because she's not Sarah yet, says, logically, where are we moving, dear? And he says, somewhere. And she says, where is somewhere? And he says, I don't know. And she says, then why are we going? And he says, because God told us to. And he'll show us when we get there. Can you imagine that conversation? Would you want to have that conversation? Well, Abram did. And amazingly, Sarai was like, okay, we're moving. And they all packed up. And Lot, uh, their nephew came with them, and all their servants, and all their cattle, and everything just kind of loaded up, and they just began to move, and God kind of told them uh, to where to go, and so they set off with all those people, and Abram's father came with them, and they traveled from Ur to Haran. And so they left Ur and traveled all the way up to Haran. So you can kind of see where that is. You're getting closer to the border of modern-day Turkey. And so that's where they were. And they stopped there for a while. And uh, when they began to move, I get this, some of you are telling me you're getting old. When this took place, Abram was 75 years old. Can you imagine moving your whole family at 75? Where? We don't know. And so there they are. They, they stopped there in Herod. And when they got there, um, they obeyed and they did what they're supposed to. And they ended up settling in Herod for a little while um, until Abram's father died. So can you imagine how old Abram's father was if Abram was 75? <laughs> on that trip. Uh, and by the way, Abram at 75 still hasn't been given the promise of having a son. He still hasn't had a son. Uh, so here we are. And, and now they travel uh, from Haran down to Shechem. And so if we could get that next map there from Haran down to Shechem. And that is where they ended up settling. And when they arrived in Shechem, uh, God told Abraham that he was going to give him that land as far as he could see for his family and all his inheritance. That land where Shechem is, is modern day Israel. And after that, he went and he built an altar at Shechem and he worshiped God. And those that were with him moved a little bit south to the town of Bethel. And when they got to Bethel, Abraham built an altar there, and he offered some sacrifices, and he honored uh, God's name there, and he began to uh, have his family get all settled in, into Bethel. And by the way, as we go through all these children's Bible stories, remember Bethel, because Bethel will be a key spot in a lot of our stories. And so we're going to leave Abram at Bethel right now. And if you want to find out what happens next week, and you think, wow, Abram was this mighty guy of faith. To get up and move like that and obey God all those times, come back next week and you'll find out Abram's not perfect. All right? Abram's just like any one of us who are walking by faith, journeying with God, uh, doing their best. Uh, next week we'll find out that Abram was a man of faith and he worshiped God with all his heart, but he wasn't perfect. And we'll learn some more about the life of Abraham. So hopefully, as we continue to do these children's Bible stories, 
uh, you're able to learn more about the Bible, learn some stories about the Bible, and be able to put some things uh, together. And uh, hopefully they, they help the children that are young. And um, we have some pretty old children in the church, too. You, know? yeah. so you don't believe me? You should see. I think that's, it's okay. Uh, and so we enjoy that. Now, uh, for Father's Day, here's what we've done. First of all, again, Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. And uh, we have a gift we would like to give you because we appreciate you and all that you do with your family, with your children, at church, uh, at work, in our community. And so we, my, my wife brought me to a realization that um, I didn't thought, th think ever could be true. Would you actually believe there are people in this church, let alone in the world, who don't like chocolate? How can that be? But I was informed by my wife that some people don't like chocolate. So, on this half of the table are Father's Day gifts for the fathers of like mind. They are chocolate based. Right? On this side of the table are the people that I'll be watching you. I want to know who you are. <laughs> who do not like chocolate. But there is a little bit of chocolate in there. But most of it's not chocolate. And uh, on the front, you can use the can, the, the jar frame that you like, but it does say, uh, Dad jokes loading, please wait. And uh, so that is your. Um, Father's Day present from the church. And so after church, if you'd like to come by, if you'd like to send a child to come get it for you, they get you one. Um, if you would like to come by yourself and pick up your own gift so that way you can get which one you want, uh, you're welcome to come by and do that. You immediately fall into service. And with it is a little uh, little thing that says, Dad, that we'd like you to have. Uh, just as a gift from our church to you as a father, we appreciate you. And do not go running off immediately after church, okay? Because following the church service, we have a chocolate sponge cake and a strawberry cheesecake. Uh, so that way, make sure you get your slice of cake. We cannot put them out on display uh, because if we did that, we can't serve them to you. And so someone immediately after service will go, they'll cut them up, they'll serve each person their own piece because we can't have a buffet style and just have to leave them out there for you to come get. And we'll do everything we can uh, to be as, as possible and compliant as we can. And, uh, but we still want you to not miss out on your piece of cake, right? It wouldn't be Father's Day at the beginning without a gift and your cake. And so uh, remember to get your cake after service. And if you're not a father, let the fathers go first getting the cake. And I'm I could be wrong, but I don't think the fathers will eat all the cake we have. So there should be some left for everybody else um, to have a piece immediately following uh, the service. Uh, we appreciate that. Now, uh, as usual, uh, the offering are on the boxes on the welcome table. There is a, an offering for the regular offering and an admissions offering for our missionaries. Uh, right in front of the computer where you check in and you come, there are some invitations to church. If you'd like to grab some, you invite people to the church or letterbox area where you live. Uh, they're in bounds of 100, and uh, those are there for you. At this time, uh, someone is coming to do the scripture reading. It looks like it's Simon. All right, so he'll come to the scripture reading. So uh, grab your Bible, turn to Titus chapter 3. Uh, Titus chapter 3, it's in the New Testament towards the back of the New Testament. And uh, he'll be reading verses 3 to verse 7 for you this morning. So, so I'm like said, to say, you'll be reading from Titus, and chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. Alright, starting from verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving doubtless lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration 
and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Many of you who were helpers in children's church and Sunday school uh, before we had the, the close down uh, period, uh, if you would like to jump back in and be involved again in helping uh, with children's church that takes place, that's for those that are uh, four and under. Uh, right now, they, if their parents would like them to go, they can go to children's church. It's just back there. And uh, if you have not begun helping again but would like to, uh, please do not leave this morning without seeing my wife. Uh, so that way she can get your name ready to go again, get you rostered on there. Uh, we can ensure you have a valid blue card and all those things that are required uh, for working with children. And uh, we'll get you plugged in and, and back involved and in serving there. Uh, because you know what? You were giving, if you're here today, you know Christ your Savior, you were giving gifts and the gifts are to... Keep to yourself and hoard from everyone. Is that right? No. They're to use to serve and to be a blessing and a benefit. And so if you'd like to serve in that way, please see my wife after service. Um, she will get you signed up for that. Also, uh, from the 22nd to the 26th of September is our men and boys camp. If you are wanting to go to that but you have not signed up for that yet, we're asking that everyone be signed up by the end of service tonight, by the close of today. Uh, so that way we can be all prepared and have all the food bought and everything ready to go. Uh, we can be sure we have a place for you to sleep. Um, if you don't tell us and you show up, well, we'll hopefully have food for you. And there should be somewhere for you to sleep, but we'll see how it goes. But if you do sign up, we can assure you it's all good to go. And then hopefully during that time, sometime that all the men are away, 
uh, the ladies are going to have an event, and my wife will let you know about that as well. And, uh, and then just so you know, if you do have a child that is between the ages of 13 and 18, so between, say, going into year 7 and year 12, even if you graduate year 12 in December, you're still allowed to come to this. January 4th to January 8th, we're going to be having a youth camp. Uh, you want to sign up. I just verified with the camp today that as of right now, we can still hold camp. And so we're going ahead. We're planning it. There's going to be some adjustments and changes to some things. Uh, we're praying that the border gets open because if the border doesn't get open, our speaker... We'll be stuck in Sydney, uh, but we'll come up with other speakers. It'll be okay. We'll still have camp. It just would be nice to have Pastor Juana with us, um, but we'll take that all by ear, and uh, we'll keep going with it. So January 4th to January 8th um, is our youth camp. Uh, we'll be getting together with about 8 to 10 other churches all around um, Brisbane, from as far north as Gladstone to all the way down to the, sun, the Gold Coast. And uh, all the way as far west as Toowoomba or um, further west than that, too, uh, to be able to come and all come together and have a big youth camp together. So make your plans for that. Uh, if you need some help, it's $190 to go to camp for a week, which is not bad for all your food, all your lodging, everything. Uh, but if you need some help with that, let me know, and we'll put some fundraisers together and help you raise the funds because... We do not want any young person not able to go to camp simply because they don't have the money, all right? And so if you would do that for me, that would be great. Uh, but now, Hebrews, I mean, not Hebrews, wrong, wrong message. Uh, that's for tonight. Titus chapter uh, 3. Uh, Titus chapter 3. And we'll be looking at verses 3 to verse 7 as Simon read them. Uh, but have you ever had, and we're going to be looking at continuing on with this idea, and remember, we've been talking about what real Christianity is, and we've talked about all these different things, and now we're going to be talking about this thing this morning that I'm going to be calling new life, old flesh. You know, there's just that, this struggle when you accept Christ as your Savior between the old nature and the new nature. Have you, have you figured that one out yet? Have you had that struggle? Have you ever had your emotions trick you into feeling something that your mind knows is not true? You're looking at me like, mm. I'll be honest with you. I have an incredible fear of being closed in. Combine that with the dark. Combine that with being dropped. Some amusement park rides are not for me. Now, in my mind, I know that the amusement park cannot do anything knowingly that's going to kill me. Right? They'd kind of be out of business if they did that, wouldn't they? However, if you put this person, strap them, me into a ride that is indoors, in the dark, and I know it's going to drop me, my brain starts doing irrational things. It starts panicking. <sighs> My heart starts beating really fast. My, my hands start really sweating. And speeds of sweat come. And I'm like, get me out! And if you're my family, especially my wife, you think that's funny. And she's like, dear, they can't do anything to hurt you. I don't believe you. And I can remember one time when we were at an amusement park and we were coming, and it was a water ride, we were coming, and there was this wall of flames. And I'm like, see, I told you they're going to kill me! Look at the fire! But right as we were about to hit the fire, the, the ride went, woo! And drops me in the car. Now, has anyone else ever had your emotions tell you something is to be feared or something is not true? that your mind knew full well is. Well, I had to warn Brother June, because I have an illustration for you, right? And I warned Brother June that while he was sing, the singing, if he looked down, not to jump off the stage, okay? I was given this bowl years ago. And this bowl, as you can see, 
has a snake. See that? And if you look at it quickly, it looks real. Now, what I do with it, it stays on my desk in my office, and I put prayer cards in it. Believe it or not, my snake bowl has my missionary prayer cards in it. And every so often, I'll pick up my missionary prayer cards out of my snake bowl, and I'll begin flipping through my missionary prayer cards, praying for the missionaries. Um, and there's missionaries here that we support. There's missionaries here that we don't support. Uh, there's all kinds of missionaries in here that I, that I pray for. But they live in my snake bowl. Now, I was given this snake bowl by a family, by a man in our church in Darwin. And, and my intention was to bring it back to the States with us in 2012 when we went back on furlough to report to churches. And put our prayer cards in here on our display table and see who really had enough faith to pray for us. Because they would have had to take them out of the bowl. Now, unfortunately, our luggage was overweight and this weighs a bit, so I couldn't take it with me. Uh, so instead, it stayed here and now it's on my desk. But you say, what are you talking about? Well, as you look at the staple, I can remember, how many of you remember the Dietrichs, missionaries in Solomon Islands? Uh, when his wife was here for some medical treatment and they were staying in her house, one Sunday morning, I had forgot something. And they hadn't left yet. And so I rung them up and I said, bro, can you go into my office? And can you go on my desk? And yeah, there's going to be some piles of paper, but if you lift up this particular pile of paper, underneath that will be this USB stick. Can you grab the USB stick and bring it and have stuff on it we need for church? Sure, no worries, brother Joe, I'll go do that. I have forgotten about the bowl. <laughs> And I heard the story later, he lifted up the paper, and right as he lifted up the paper, all he saw was a snake head sticking out. Can I just tell you, at that moment, he had an emotional reaction that overrode his brain, that he knew couldn't be true. And he told me, he went running out of my office, and I got a text message. And he said, I started texting you, and then I deleted it, and I stopped. And I thought, no, 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 I can get through this. I'm a missionary on a remote jungle island. I can get through this snake in his office. And then he thought, wait a minute. Brother Marshall wouldn't know him when he sent me into his office to lift up these papers. The snake is going to kill me. So he said, I think I'll go investigate. His, the, the, the true side of his brain began to kick in. And he walked in, and he said he lifted up the paper again, and it didn't move. And he looked at it closely, he's like, it's ceramic. I am going to have to kill you one day. <laughs> and so you see, these type of things can make us have an emotional reaction that our brain knows is not true, correct? You say, what does that have to do with anything? I'll put my snake bowl down here, and we'll go to the message, but we'll come back and revisit the bowl, okay? Uh, throughout the message. Uh, but as we begin to, to think of that, we, we come into this world that we live in who says that there is no God, that man is God. So we worship the creature and not the creator. And the conclusion is, really, you are nothing. But you are God. You are nothing, but you are God. Doesn't that make you feel special? You're nothing, but you're God, and God's nothing. Culture says you're just here for a little bit, and you live for pleasure and nothing else. Can I tell you, this deceptive belief system breaks down with one word. You know what that word is? Conscience. Your conscience tells you there's something more. Your conscience, the word of God says, tells you that there is more to life than this what we see. Conscience is the knowledge of right and wrong. You say, oh, that's not necessarily true. Oh, yeah, little children know right from wrong. Hey, you've seen Thomas. Thomas is, oh, at the end of this month, he'll be one year old, okay? But I'm telling you, that boy at 11 months knows right from wrong in a lot of ways. You say, why? He knows there's certain things he shouldn't be touching. Like in our living room, um, right by my wife's chair, there is a drawer that he likes to open. 
And we keep telling him no, 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 no. So now here's what he does. He'll army crawl over to the drawer. And he'll look up. And he'll look around to see if anyone's watching. And when he's verified that no one he thinks is watching, the little hand goes up for the handle. And he grabs it. And when he pulls it open, he lets out the biggest giggle until he forgets to move this hand and closes said hand into the drawer. Then he lets out more than is an ouch. You say, well, what do you mean? Why is he looking around to make sure no one's watching? Because he knows that is no, right? He knows that is wrong. He knows that shouldn't, he shouldn't be doing that. Yes or no? See, and he's only 11 months old. And in some ways, he knows some right from some wrong. He just hasn't learned sometimes that the consequence is not worth it. All right? But he does know that. You say, why? And the word of God in Romans chapter 1, verse 19, it says, because that which... Uh, may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. See, yes, you are much more than the body that you are. So, let's take a look at this, and let's examine this idea of having a new life, but still have the old flesh. Uh, the first thing we're going to look at this morning is this. You are a three-part creation. There's three parts of you. According to the Word of God, there is three parts to man. God tells us this in uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, so just a, a few books to your left of the book of Titus, is the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, in other words, all of you, and I pray God your spirit and your soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he's talking about the whole body, and then he says your spirit, your soul, and your body. Again, the Bible says in James 2, verse 26, whereas the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, For which cause we faint not, but through, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. These verses explain that you are made up in one being, but three parts. Your spirit, your soul, and your body. Now, it is nearly impossible to separate these three parts of your being. Absolutely, correct? If I take your body away from your soul and spirit you kind of have problems. If I take your spirit away from your soul and your body, you're going to have more problems, right? They're kind of inseparable, but they're, but they're all there. And, and, and the thing is, they are, they're connected and interwoven, and words sometimes are used interchangeably in the scriptures. And so we're going to look at a generalization of God's very complex design for mankind. So first of all, uh, let's look at the thing that we're most familiar with, body, right? You look at it every day when you look in the mirror, correct? Yeah. It's the thing that when you, you know, do too much, especially as you get older, lets you know about it, especially when you try to get up the next morning. Your body is what we would call the flesh. It's this, this grouping of skin and bones and all those types of things. Uh, when you're sick, Hopefully you take it to a doctor. So that way you can be fixed up. Uh, when you're hurt, you mend it. Right? You cut the body, you, you bandage it up. Uh, you break the body, you break the bone, hopefully you get it all put back together again. Correct? You got to fix it up. Over time, I, this may be a shock. Are you ready? Over time, your body ages. Right? I know it's a fact you like to deny. But over time, our body ages, and over time, our body will begin to break down. It's just the way it is. Uh, Paul said it, is that in this we groan, the body groans. Uh, we wish 
we can have a new body that matches our new nature, don't we? When you accept Christ as your Savior and you got a new nature, you get a whole new body that's what that that doesn't happen. Then we're going to look at the second thing is your soul. Your soul is the inner you. It's what occupies your body. It's your mind, your will, and emotions. It's what the Bible often calls your heart. Have you ever heard the phrase, uh, accept, have you accepted Christ into your heart? That's what it's talking It's not actually saying, have you accepted the Lord as your Savior into like your blood pumping organ. So Jesus is not interested in coming into the, you know, the, the organ and sends the blood out, right? I don't know. It's talking about your, your soul. Like, it is the, the one, it's your intellect, it's your will, it's your emotions. With that ability to think and choose and feel, your soul is complex. It's the sum total of your inner man that processes and wills you forward through every experience, every relationship. It's your personality. It's what makes you uniquely you. Have you ever noticed that everyone that we go to church with is unique? They're different? Different personalities, different interests, different ways of dressing, different styles, correct? Yeah? And that's okay. That's your soul. That's, that's what's uniquely you. That, that's great. That's wonderful. Uniqueness and difference and, uh, uh, within each other. That's not a bad thing. Uh, we, we live in a day and a time where we think unless everyone's exactly like us, they're wrong and wicked. No, no, no. The individuality is okay. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. That's what it's talking about. Your, your soul. And then we've got to the, we get to the spirit. Now, uh, your spirit is a source of your deepest being. Before you accept Christ as your Savior, this was essentially your sin nature. And according to the Word of God, it was spiritually, it calls it dead. That's why it says being born again. This was the sinful root system uh, that was fallen man and really could not come to God. The Bible will call this part the old man, correct? Uh, your source, uh, your spiritual genetics were proficient at producing sin. Has anyone ever had to teach your child how to sin? Now they were good at it right away, weren't they? Has anyone ever had to teach you how to do wrong? No, you're pretty good at it on your own, aren't you? Let's be honest. You say, why? It's just that way. Uh, God's Holy Spirit, if you know Christ as your Savior, is now within you, enabling your new nature to know God and experience His grace and transforms His very presence in your life. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of the world which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You see, God desires for you to be led by His Spirit in all your life. The Holy Spirit is within you to dictate truth to your soul. So that Spirit, remember, remember the illustration about how your emotions tells the part of your brain Things that aren't true, your spirit and God's spirit are what's to dictate to you the truth. Here's what I mean. Well, let's go back to uh, my friend. Ready? Now, first thing that happens with a man when um, Brother Dietrich lifted this bowl. His spirit knows the truth that should make him free from fear. My spirit knows, your spirit knows the truth that should make you free from fear of this thing because I have told you it is surrender, right? Yes? Okay. You should now, if you ever come to my house, and you ever walk in my office, well, if you do, it's at your own risk, uh, but if you ever, 
You say, what do you mean? Come to my house, you'll find out. Uh, and you ever walk into my office, and you ever are go onto my desk and see this, you now possess the truth that you should not fear. Yes? Okay. And, and, and your soul should process the truth with a calm, emotional response, an intelligent response, that this is not a real snake, and you have no need to jump and scream and run. Yes? Okay. So therefore, your body should obey it and make it happen. In other words, you should keep walking calmly. And if I say to you, would you grab one of those missionary prayer cards out of my bowl and please pray for them? You should have no problem coming in, pulling that out, snake or no snake. Yes? That's how it should happen. <laughs> now, what about when you're caught off guard? What about, you know this is in my office, I told you. What about if I move it to the kitchen table? <laughs> And what if, when you come over, we put dinner rolls in it? <laughs> you get where I'm going with this? And then we put a tea towel over it. Yeah? And then we say, hey, so-and-so, can you please lift the tea towel and grab me a roll? Now, mind you, you already have the fact, you know it's not real. But now we've got an element of surprise. You weren't expecting it there. You don't expect this on the dinner table, sitting there, holding bread rolls, to lift the thing and to see a snake. And what if we did it in a way where when you lifted it, all that came out was a snake's eyes and face? You see, when that happens, first, the spirit gets shut down. The fact that you know the truth, but that's ceramic. And truth becomes irrelevant. Urgency leaps over truth, correct? Emotions declares, stay! Get out of the dining room! And then the body responds with an adrenaline rush, an increased heart rate, heightened nerves, and the come on here! And that's when you see people jump and throw the everything, right? And then there's no bread rolls for anyone because they're like, ah! <laughs> In this case, it's usually funny to everyone at the table but the person who's caught by surprise. <laughs> Correct? Although, if they have a good sense of humor later on when they realize, you know, I knew that was fake. You told me it was fake. It was a whole sermon illustration about how fake it was. And you told me about this. And what if now you come over and actually do it with the bread rolls? You, I mean, I haven't even told you what I'm going to do. Right? Well, the world's value system places body and soul in control. Without the spirit. In Jesus, for the first time in your life, you know, Christ is saying you have a new nature with a spiritual capacity to yield to a different master. You have access to absolute truth through Christ and his word. You can now begin to experience a total renewing of your mind and transformation of your life based on truth. So, if the body is of three parts, then we're going to learn this from Titus chapter 3, which we read. Salvation is a three-part miracle. Have you ever accepted Christ? In your, by that I mean this. I don't mean that you go to church, because anyone can come to church. And by that I don't mean that you're religious, in other words, you read your Bible. Anyone can read a Bible. It does not make them a Christian. I mean, yesterday I worked on the brakes of my car. Believe me, that does not make me a mechanic. There's some things I'm just not touching. Okay? I'm not a mechanic just because I was in my garage with tools and had a car apart. Here's what I mean by, by, by a Christian. Someone who has put their faith and trust in what Christ did when he came and died on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins. 
believing that he was buried in that borrowed tomb, he rose again on the third day, and he lives now to ever make intercession for you and for me. And he says, whosoever will may come, and you have personally put your faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone to forgive you of your sins, and that's it. Not your good works, not your religion, not how much you give to the poor, but you put your faith and trust in Christ, and you come to him as the word of God says. That's what I'm meaning uh, by this as a Christian. What we're about to look at is critical to understanding salvation. Because there's a lot of people who put their faith and trust in Christ, and they say, you know what? I don't feel saved. Have you ever not felt saved? Some of you are all just super spiritual giants, and you're just all lying to me. Because I saw like three heads go. And I'm thinking, wow, if only three people have ever not felt saved, either I'm really messed up, which that's neither here nor there, uh, or they, I, I passed with some unbelievably spiritual people. We've all probably not felt saved, right? Have you ever felt that salvation wasn't like fully complete? And now you're going to be like, this is a trick question. Because if I say I feel salvation is not fully complete, you're going to pull something on it. Well, guess what? When we look at this three-step miracle that's outlined in Titus chapter 2, here's what we're going to find. Salvation isn't complete. Oh, I just woke up some people. You say, you know how I woke up some people? I saw so interesting faces. So at least I get to awake, right? So we got like, I was enjoying sleeping. Uh, now I get to thinking. Okay? Much of our study has been building to this very point. If you will walk in on this framework, it will make a major light bulb come on in your head. And much of God's word will make a lot more sense to you if you can get this down. Ready for it? If I set it up enough for you? First, we're going to take a look at a few passages of Scripture to get a scriptural view. Fair enough? So take your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 30. Again, if you're in the book of Titus, there's a couple books to your left. Keep your finger in the book of Titus. We'll be coming right back there. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we'll read verse 30. It says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The key words from that passage are righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Remember those words as they will relate directly to the work of salvation in your life. Now go back to Titus chapter 3. We'll look at verse 4 and verse, and verse 7. It says, but after that, the kindness of God, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope eternal, the hope of eternal. The, to the hope of eternal life. Now, some of the key phrases that, that from that passage are wash of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit, and heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Hold on to these as well and put them together. So what do these and many other passages teach us about salvation? Well, each verse shows us the work of salvation is more than just a one-time event. It's more than just you putting your faith and trust in Christ. Right? Regeneration, renewal, all these different things. Your spirit was made instantly new when you believed. That is what we call the new birth that we looked at last week. Your soul is being renewed daily by the Spirit of God. This is referred to as renewing of your mind. Have you ever you know, realize that after you accept Christ your Savior, you start reading the Bible, you start thinking differently. 
different issues, you think, see things differently. What? It's renewing of your mind. Your body will be made new eventually, so hold on to that hope, right? That's final redemption. Think in terms of three words. We're going to look at three words real quickly. Regeneration, renewal, redemption. Three parts of salvation. First of all, regeneration. Your spirit was regenerated. In other words, it was regenerated the moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. We looked at that in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. It's not by works of righteousness which he had done, but according to his mercy, he saved you. All right? And so we, we see that right, right there. Your spirit was regenerated. It was regenerated. That's when he looked. Remember when we looked at talking about um, being born again. When Jesus looked at Nicodemus, if you remember a couple weeks ago, he said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus was like, I have to enter my mother's womb a second time? What's this reborn thing? That's what he's referring to. That regeneration, moment of salvation, you were reborn, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Second thing is renewal. Your soul is being renewed by his daily work in your life. The Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Why is it so important to be in the Word of God? Because He's renewing you day by day. The more you intake, the more He'll renew you day by day. He's renewing you day by day. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23 says, And be renewed in your spirit of your mind. Colossians 3, verse 10 says, And I put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. You see, this idea is that renewing of our mind, renewing of ourselves, or, or this, this type of thing in, in, within us, is a day-by-day -day thing. So was salvation com like completely done at the moment of salvation? No. It's taking place day by day as you are being renewed. Let's hope you aren't the same person you were yesterday or a week ago. I mean, many of us, let's be honest, the world as we know it is different from before we had the lockdown period till now. Yes? If you're like, no, it's not different. Where are you living? You know, it's a, it's a different world. Now, some people are like, I'm just going to live the same no matter what. I don't care. Well, that, that's, you're entitled to that. It's your opinion, correct? But by and large, the world as we know it has changed. So guess what? You're probably not the same person as you were in January. It's the way it is. And in, in your journey, in your walk with God, real Christianity you are being renewed day by day. It's not a one-time thing. Well, I'm a Christian now, so therefore I am super spiritual. Nope. Not happening. It's a daily thing. Day by day, you need to be renewed. That is why we say, get in the Word of God yourself and study it day by day. Third thing, real quick, redemption. Redemption. Your body will one day be redeemed. But how many of you have noticed it's not quite there yet? Don't believe me? Well, in, in, in that day when it's fully redeemed, isn't there no more sickness, no more pain? How many of you have been sick? You ain't redeemed yet fully, are you? No more pain. So that means if I walk up to you and punch you in the nose, which I won't do, Sake of illustration again, don't, don't. All of a sudden, there's a line of people, I'm going to death pass before he hits me. I'm not going to hit you. But if I walk up to you and punch you in the nose, and your nose, would your nose not start bleeding and hurting? Or would you be like, no, I don't have any more pain? <laughs> well, again, guess what? If your nose would break or start bleeding, you aren't fully redeemed. You don't have your completely redeemed body yet. You ain't there yet. Right? I mean, we always say that we agree with that, but 
thinking that and putting it into the context is a little bit helpful. I mean, at least it was to me when I was sitting going, oh, well, yeah, you know. Putting it all, have you ever had little bits of knowledge here and there and it, and it all comes together and you go, bing, light bulb. Yeah. Redemption. Your body will one day be redeemed and you'll be given a new body, which is not yet. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 14 says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. What that verse is teaching us is this. When you accepted Christ as your Savior and Christ's blood was applied to your account, it was as if he put a down payment on you. Have you ever had to put a down payment when you bought something? What is, if you say, okay, if you go to the store and you're going to buy a car, and they only have one on the lot, and they'll say, well, if you don't have the money on you now and you need to go work out your bank loan or you need to go get the money out of the bank, we need a deposit on the car to hold it for you. And you give them a deposit, right? And if it's like, say, $2,000, you give them $2,000. What that deposit means is that car is intended to be yours and you've put money down for them to hold it for you but you still got to come back and fulfill the rest of the contract right you've got to give them all the money you understand when when you were accepted at christ your savior and christ's blood was put to your account it was a down payment in other words, he said, you know, I am starting my work in you, and this is a down payment. This is the earnest. And when, when, when you get to heaven, I make good on my down payment. The whole thing's complete. It's done. But it's that in-between stage. That in-between stage from the moment you accept Christ your Savior to the moment full redemption is complete, that there's a lot of Interesting thing, right? There's a lot of, I don't feel say that. Well, you know what? Guess what? There we are. So, third thing, real quick, is this. And that, if you don't feel saved all the time and you, you wonder, you know, guess what? You're not complete. You are a work in progress. Scripture says that. You're a work in progress. The really good news about our being in the middle of this threefold process is that it means the final step is yet to come. When we feel frustrated with our struggle we are in, we can know that one day we will experience deliverance completely from any struggle. You say, you can break down into three more things. Number one, the new birth. The new birth. It happens the moment you accept Christ as your Savior. Your faith in Jesus allows Him to make you a new creature at the spiritual level of your being. This is the one-time, final, forever event. And that's what we usually concentrate on, right? We say salvation is a one-time, final event. No, no, salvation is not the new birth is. The new birth is being born again is a one-time, final event. You're born into a new family. And then we find there's a new mind. This is happening in you right now and for the rest of your life. Until uh, you are with God, this is the renewing work of the Holy Spirit, changing and transforming you from the inside out, conforming you to the image and mind of Christ. It's something you can act, you cannot accurately measure or sense. You know, I can't go up to you and say, "Here, I'm going to measure." You know, are you? How conform are you to the mind of Christ? I look at you. I'm about seventy-five percent. Okay, you still got a little ways to go. Okay, you're about 10%. What are you going to do with it? Uh, you're, I can't accurately measure it, can I? The scary thing is, I can't always accurately measure me. Because there are sometimes I think I'm further along than I am, and then he reveals, the, the, the word of God reveals to me, <laughs> no, you're not. You still got to do that. You got to be honest. The new mind is something you must yield to and allow on a daily process by faith. You either allow it or you prevent it. And this is the center point of your daily struggle. That struggle between the old man and the new man, that's what it is. 
And lastly, there's a new body. It's already created. It's just waiting for you. One day your old body will be gone and your new body will be put on. Right now your earthly body is decaying and dying. I don't care how old you are. The moment you took your first breath, you started towards your last. Death is a fearful event to most people. But to someone who's truly a follower of Christ, death is simply a step in a new body in eternity with Christ. It's something to look forward to. It's something to have great hope and joy that one day I will be with God. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Again, that's just to the left of the book of Titus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse 53 it says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Much of the verses you look at some time, 1 John 3, 2, 2 Corinthians 3, 21. But can I tell you this? If you feel as though something about salvation is incomplete, you're kind of right. Well, you are not working to be saved. You are absolutely God's work in progress. You can never be unsaved or less saved, but you are truly undergoing a process of maturity that will take you the rest of your life. Isn't that true in our, in our physical bodies too? Like, aren't we like, well, we're supposed to be, right? Maturing as we get older, learning from our mistakes. People are getting like, hmm? Spiritually too. So to summarize, your salvation was a one-time decision that began an everyday process that leads to a someday completion. Right? It was a one-time decision that began a daily process that leads to a one-day final completion. Christ is regenerating, regenerates you instantly, renews you daily, and will completely redeem you eventually. Regeneration is the moment of salvation. Renewal is that daily struggle of growth. Redemption is your eternal hope, that which you can anticipate and look forward to. Your eternal destiny is sealed and certain. If you're here this morning, you know Christ is your Savior. Your daily growth is up to Jesus working in you, and you're yielding to his work in your life by faith. Your ultimate promise that one day Jesus will redeem you from the struggle and give you a perfect sinless body is in the perfect forever one day. Until we see Christ, we're just caught in between. This is at times a very frustrating place to be. Thankfully, you can be saved and safe. Our sin was nailed to the cross of Christ. And we don't need to fear any punishment or separation from God for our sins. We're trapped in a fleshly body that still struggles every day. We're not who we were. How many of you say, praise the Lord to that? But we're also not who we should be. That's not as exciting, is it? You are not who you were. Accept it. Appreciate it. You are not who you used to be. You are a new creature with a, with a new Savior and a new life. Much of it is unrealized. But all the potential is within you by God's grace to accomplish that. You are not who you, would, who you will be. Accept that. Anticipate it. Real Christianity is a growing journey, day by day walk with God, in which He is transforming and renewing you by His power, not your own. This realization of being in between can either lead you to hope or despair. And sometimes, both in the same day. 
Yeah. You're like, I thought you were encouraging me. I'm just trying to be real with you. And scripture with you. And that, that struggle of, of uh, both on the same day, well, guess what? We'll look at more when we come back next Sunday, okay? And we'll continue on this, this journey together of what it means to be a real Christian. And if you're here this morning and you would say to me, Pastor Joe, I don't know 100% sure if, if I have my sins forgiven. If I have a real, if I'm really a Christian or if I'm just religious, I would have no greater joy than to be able to take the Bible and show you how you can know for sure you have a relationship with God. If you're here today, you know Christ is your Savior. Can I encourage you? Be encouraged. You're not the only one struggling with Hey, yes, you were saved, and that is forever settled. But you are part of a daily process. And one day, huh, redemption will be complete. We will be like Christ. But until that day, guess what? Welcome to the struggle. Welcome to the reality of the Christian life. Of saying, you know what? That was Paul. The things that I would do, I don't. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. Oh, rich man that I am. Does that kind of make a little bit more sense now? Paul was verbalizing the struggle that we're talking about. And if Paul had the struggle, guess what? If you have the struggle, you're in good company. You're not alone. Don't have to hide it, go through it. Hey, talk to people. We're all in this together. We're all in the same struggle. Maybe someone sitting right next to you has gone through the struggle and says, you know what, this encouraged me, and it's the one thing you need to hear. By the way, that's why we encourage you to come to church. Guess what? Because sometimes you come and it's the one thing you need to hear, you go, oh, I got it. So are, are you... Do you have an old flesh, an old nature? Yes. Do you have a new life, a new beginning? Yes. One doesn't really make the other? Wouldn't that be nice? But are we daily allowing God to transform us? Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we have together in your word. Lord, I thank you that your word is honest and open with us. Lord, we're so thankful that uh, you don't expect perfection. Oh, yes, that should be, we should strive to be like you, but Lord, you know that we're about flesh. Lord, I hope that each and every person here that knows you should say you can understand that the struggle is real. It doesn't make them less saved, it doesn't make them less of a Christian. It just makes them actively going through the daily process of you renewing us and you conforming us and working in us through your word, through your spirit. Lord, I pray that as a, as a group of believers, we can be an encouragement to one another. Pray that no one looks down at anyone who has a struggle or a difficulty in one area, remembering that we should take heed lest we fall. Or maybe encourage one another, call them sign each other in this process. And this Lord be a blessing and a help to each other as we each seek to know you in a greater way. Lord, also, if there be anyone here today that doesn't know you as your Savior, Lord, may they not today leave without getting that settled. In Christ's name we pray. Would you to come here as we close the song?
types of things available for you. I'll be able to grab and have that and then fellowship a little bit and go on your way. Uh, but again, if we can help you in any way, please let us know. We look forward to seeing you back tonight. Uh, Five o'clock will be our evening service. We'll be continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. We look forward to that. Uh, Wednesday nights, we still have our Wednesday nights uh, prayer meeting and Bible study uh, via Zoom. And so if you'd like to attend that, please let me know. I'll send you the link out. And uh, that we've been enjoying that time uh, together, and uh, we look forward to that. All right, so let's close service in a word of prayer, and you'll be dismissed. Fathers, please come get your gifts and uh, grab something to let the fathers to go first um, on the cake, and then uh, we'll go from there. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Again, Lord, we thank you so much for the earthly fathers that you've given us. But Lord, if I know many don't have the the best of earthly dads, a few may not. But Lord, we're thankful that you are our Heavenly Father and that you are the Father of the fatherless. And we appreciate that so much and thank you for, for what that means. And Lord, we pray that as we go from this place, 
And may we realize that we're in a daily journey, a daily renewal. And may we actively participate uh, in that, getting in your word, allowing you to work in our lives. And Lord, may we look forward to the day when the redemption work will be completed. And we'll be like you in, in your presence forever. But until then, help us as we live our daily lives to be a testimony for you. And we'll be with us as we go from this place, bring us back safely together tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.